This lesson on pharmacology and the autonomic nervous system is probably going to be the most in-depth you're going to get in autonomics in this course. But keep in mind, we want to approach this with the pharmacologic mindset. What medications can we give to alter or derange the system? In this first lesson, we're going to discuss the system in general. And in the subsequent lessons, dive into the sympathetics and the parasympathetics and the drugs that go along with them. The autonomic nervous system is automatic. That is, you cannot control it with your will. It is reflexive, responsive. And it is comprised of two different systems. The parasympathetic nervous system, rest and digest, and the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. I'm sure you've heard that many times. Sympathetic stimulates, parasympathetic pauses. What I want to do is show you the anatomical organization of the ANS, that is how the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems compare to each other. Then look at the physiology between the two, what receptors and neurotransmitters are used, what's that setup look like. And then get into how it affects certain organ systems. The lungs, the heart, the blood vessel, and the eye are a great way to test you on your ability of do you know this system. So let's just start off with some anatomy to start. This is the spinal cord. The, on the left is going to be the anatomy. On the right is going to be the function. Let's talk about the anatomy, the structure of the system first. The parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system are very different in what they do and in how they're structured. The parasympathetic neurons come from the brainstem. They form no trunk. They're thin, wispy connections that travel from the brainstem out into the periphery. In the periphery, in what's called a ganglion, is where these first order central nervous neurons synapse with and innervate ganglionic neurons. The postganglionic neurons send fibers out to affect their organs to exert their effect. The parasympathetic nervous system also comes from the very end of the spinal column. S2 to S5 is also parasympathetic nervous system. And there here again, first order neurons synapse with the second order postganglionic neurons which send out fibers to the effector organs. At the same time, from T1 to L4, the sympathetic nervous system is putting out sympathetic fibers. Only these sympathetic fibers are originating from the spinal cord and connect to form what's called the sympathetic trunk. So each level of vertebra has a sympathetic fiber exiting, and it enters this cascade, not of ganglion. There's no synapses going on in the sympathetic trunk. But what it does is allow the connections from T1 to travel all the way down and come out the level of, of L4. No, no connection has been made yet. In this sense, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system share the fact that they must reach a ganglion in order to, for their first order neurons to synapse with the second order neurons which send out their final signal to the effector organs. Now for convenience, I've drawn this to look like the sympathetic nervous system only innervates T1 through L4 and the parasympathetic system innervates only where it comes from. Unfortunately, it's much harder than that. That is, these effector organs are, of course, going to cross over so that there's parasympathetic nervous innervation to all organs, as well as sympathetic stimulation to all organs. 
The point is that anatomically, the parasympathetic nervous system comes from the brain stem and the end of the spinal cord, and it has no trunk. Whereas the sympathetic nervous system arises from T1 through L4, does have a trunk, and the similarities between them is that there is the first degree neurons which come from the central nervous system that then find a ganglion in which they synapse onto the second order neurons which then go have their effect on the effector organ. The sympathetic trunk is big, it's visible, you can see it and gross. Parasympathetic ganglion, they're wispy fibers, you can see them on microscopy, but you will be tough to find a parasympathetic fiber when doing a surgery. On the right, we're going to talk about function. And we still have this preganglionic concept, the ganglion itself, and then postganglionic or the effector organ. The parasympathetic fibers enter the ganglion and synapse with the postganglionic fiber through nicotinic, big N, acetylcholine receptors. Acetylcholine is released into the space in the ganglion, and nicotinic receptors pick it up, and that tells the secondary neuron to release its signal to the effector cell. The parasympathetic nervous system is all acetylcholine. Acetylcholine at the ganglion, acetylcholine at the effector cell, only the effector cell is going to be using muscarinic receptors for the most part to effect, have its effect. Nicotinic receptors in the ganglion, muscarinic receptors in the periphery. Therefore, the PNS is said to be cholinergic. Cholinergic because it uses only acetylcholine. Now, the sympathetic nervous system came from somewhere evolutionarily, so there is an acetylcholine releasing primary neuron that synapses with a nicotinic receptor that then goes and releases acetylcholine, just like parasympathetic. We're going to pretend this doesn't exist because it makes it confusing. Let's just say that the parasympathetic nervous system uses nicotinic, then muscarinic receptors. It's cholinergic, whereas the Sympathetic nervous system is going to use only adrenergic receptors. That's what this next one. At the ganglion, that primary first degree neuron does still release acetylcholine. And it is still the nicotinic receptor that picks up the signal, just like in the parasympathetic. But at the level of the effector organ, the thing that gets released is norepinephrine. And on the effector cell, there are receptors for a number of different adrenergic receptors. That is alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2. Alpha-2 is generally not innervated. So there has to be another way to stimulate that. And there's a special mechanism where we have sympathetic nerve fibers that go to a ganglion, release their acetylcholine, bind to cells that have nicotinic receptors, only these cells are not in any ganglion, they're in the adrenal medulla. And the medulla secretes epinephrine, which then can travel through the bloodstream, affecting multiple cells and activating receptors even if they aren't innervated. The idea here is that the fight or flight response that gets you running from the tiger doesn't want to run out. Right? If you had to be re-frightened to release more norepinephrine, that wouldn't make very much sense. So the norepinephrine starts the signal mediated by acetylcholine and nicotinic receptors, and then at the same time mediated by nicotinic and acetylcholine receptors, the adrenal medulla is secreting epinephrine in order to keep up with the norepinephrine to carry on its signal forward. Therefore, the SNS is said to be adrenergic. Adrenergic because it's coming from the adrenal gland. Epinephrine's effect is mimicked by norepinephrine and epinephrine. To make this problem a little more confusing, we also have that second order neuron that sits in the motor horn that through the peripheral nerve is a somatic nerve fiber, one that is under your control. It goes to a muscle 
where it secretes acetylcholine and will cause contraction of that muscle by a nicotinic receptor. But this nicotinic receptor is found only at the site of muscle, NM, acetylcholine receptor. So what I'm gonna to do to make this easier is say the word nicotinic or muscarinic. I'm not gonna abbreviate N or M because we have N for nicotinic, M for muscarinic, and now we have an NM found in the somatic fibers. We're not gonna talk about this this lesson. This is not autonomic, but I just wanna show you the nomenclature gets pretty confusing. So what we've got so far is we've got an anatomic difference based on where they originate and the presence of a trunk, and now we have a physiologic difference on the type of effectors, receptors their target organs have. All autonomics operate the first connection with a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Then afterwards, parasympathetic nervous system acts through muscarinic receptors, whereas sympathetic nervous system acts through norepinephrine and epinephrine on the adrenergic receptors. At any time, this is a balance between the tone of the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. And by tone, I mean how much activity there is of each one. By this, I mean you could tip the scales in favor of the sympathetic nervous system either by increasing the, the sympathetic tone, how much activity these fibers have, or by decreasing the parasympathetic tone, activating the sympathetics or blocking the parasympathetics will look like an overactivity of the sympathetic nervous system. Now our body is maintained by homeostasis. The autonomic nervous system is going to attempt to automatically correct for any transition or change. And that means that we're gonna be able to identify reflexes. And reflexes always win, except when you have ganglion blockers in place.